Welcome back to Cultural Anthropology. I'm David Leitner. I'll be your instructor. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the history in which anthropology first um, arose and um, how ethics became a thing in anthropology and what those ethics are. Um, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So, every country, more or less, has its own um, anthropological professional association. In America, it's the AAA, or the American Anthropological Association. In the UK, Great Britain, uh, it's the ASA, the Association for Social Anthropology. Social Anthropology and Cultural Anthropology are basically the same. Um, and... These are sort of the main points of the uh, of the ethics guides that they have. Uh, the American Anthropological Association has gone with the wording of pr principles of professional responsibility, um, and they are pretty straightforward. Actually, do no harm. Be open and honest regarding your work. Obtain informed consent and necessary permissions weigh competing ethical obligations due collaborators and affected parties, make your results accessible, protect and preserve your records, maintain respectful and ethical professional relationships. Uh, the ASA sort of divides ethical uh, guidelines into five main areas, and then they go into detail, but I didn't list all the details here. The first is relations with and responsibilities towards research participants then relations and responsibilities towards sponsors, funders, and employers, relations and responsibilities towards colleagues in the discipline, relations with uh, one's own and host governments, so wherever you're working that government, and responsibilities to the wider society. Um, there is an implicit arrangement to some degree of what should take precedence here. The only real main thing is that in both, they consider the your responsibility towards the research participants to be the greatest responsibility you have. Uh, it should come before the other ones, although that can get very tricky under certain circumstances. Another thing they share in common, and they both go into much more detail on their websites, but another thing they share in common is that they... Um, both recognize that because ethics themselves are cultural by nature, that the circumstances of what is or isn't ethical in a particular field site may be different from field site to field site. Um, and so, although these are guidelines, um, they are um, uh, also sort of offered up merely as like I say, general guidance, not specific rules that, if broken, uh, require censure from the association. Uh, though, obviously, sort of regularly flouting them will get you, <laughs> get you some negative attention. Uh, the fact of the matter is that it's very difficult to know what is and isn't ethical in a situation where... I mean, ethics is essentially ideas about right and wrong, and ideas about right and wrong are very culturally determined. Um, we'll talk more about this in the future. Um, a great example of this is in your readings uh, for uh, Renato Rosaldo uh, in particular. I um, can't remember if that's this week or next. It all bleeds together. Um but yes, I mean, the main thing here is that before everything else, you have a responsibility to your research participants, but that doesn't mean you don't also have other responsibilities. And one of the big ones is not just, you know, you have, you're dealing with uh, your funding, the people who are giving you the money to do the research. You oftentimes have obligations to them, but um, you have obligations to other anthropologists who may want to go study in that field in the future. If you create such a mess because of the way you behaved uh, that either the participants don't want to work with anthropologists anymore or the government 
refuses to let anthropologists work there anymore, or the funding body won't support anthropologists anymore. That is a huge concern. So it's not just about your actions. You're representing an entire field uh, when you're out there acting. Um, but in general, this is kind of the way we think about ethics now. Uh, interestingly enough, the American Anthropological Association did not, I don't know when the ASA got their ethical guidelines, but the American Anthropological Association did not draft their first ethical guidelines until the 1970s. And we'll get into the reasons why a little bit later. But um, I just wanted to show you this to give you a sort of picture of where our priorities lie. And it is with our research participants, first and foremost, every time. Okay, now, that being said, one of the reasons we're so obsessed with ethics nowadays is because there are some pretty unethical origins to the field. I'm not going to mince words. Uh, uh, anthropologists have been involved in supported and backed programs of slavery, of colonialism, um, it, it, it goes on and on. So um, uh, let's come to terms with some of that, okay? Um, to start with, we have to understand where anthropology comes from. Now, anthropology shows up in the latter half of the 19th century as an actual discipline. Uh, the uh, First textbook on anthropology was published in 1870 by E.B. Tyler, uh, who was rather notorious uh, in terms of his uh, uh, consultations with the Office of Indian Affairs, later the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, which was itself set up in 1824 as a branch of the War Department. Uh, if that tells you anything about the way Americans... I think that was Andrew Jackson's time, were thinking about Native Americans in this country. Um, so the context of the late, 18th, or late 19th century is you've got three main uh, movements going on. Okay, uh, You have the emergence of evolution as an experience explanation for uh, variation and difference in the and change in the natural world. Uh, industrialization is transforming the landscape, the economy, uh, the family, the the where people live, all sorts of things. And colonialism is changing the way uh, European powers behave towards non-Europeans. All three of these are changing the way Europeans saw their relations to other people in some way, whether it was through their relationship to nature, the relationship to society and to one another, or to other groups of people. Let's start with evolution. So Charles Darwin publishes On the Origin of Species in 1860. Um, common misconception. He did not discover or invent evolution. Uh, rather, he developed a, an ex, a theory, that is, an explanation. Theory in science means something that's as good as... It's, a, it's the best kind of explanation we can come up with. And so he came up with a theory of evolution, a theory for why things change over time in, in terms of biological life. Um, that's all evolution means, change over time. So the mechanism he proposed is called descent with modification. That just means children don't look identical to their um, parents, but they do look kind of like their parents. And natural selection, that is, in some environments, certain traits are going to be favored, and, uh, which means it's more likely you'll reproduce, and, in, and uh, some traits will not be favored, means it's less likely you'll reproduce. Um, he off also wasn't the first to come up with this idea. He was just the first to sort of flesh it out into a scientific theory. Now, on the heels of On the Origin of Species came a sort of pseudoscience that was, although taking inspiration, at least titularly, from 
Charles Darwin really was not very Darwinian at all uh, when we come right down to it. And this is a school of thought called social Darwinism. Um, very quickly, the, um, Darwin's theory of natural selection was reduced rather inaccurately to the notion of competition. All things are in competition. Everything is competition. And this metaphor bleeds its way into sociology through Herbert Spencer. Uh, and he comes up with this idea of social Darwinism, which basically says, hey, um, you know, competition shapes how fit individual uh, species are out in nature. Maybe it also shapes who's fit in society and maybe the people who are at the top should be at the top because they are more fit maybe that's why they're there and if you're not at the top well that's because you're not very fit and so everybody has their place in society well the problem is of course that it sort of relied on this notion that uh um uh, it relied on a very fixed notion of what fitness was, number one. And number two, it sort of locked people into these unchangeable sort of categories. Um, uh, social Darwinism really subscribes to um, the idea that evolution is always improving things, which is not actually true. Evolution is always adapting to new situations, but it does not on a single line of predetermined improvement. Um, the other problem is, although Darwin's theory is really survival of the fit enough, you just have to be able to reproduce more than the next guy. That's the thing. Social Darwinism is survival of the fittest, um, that you are the pinnacle of survival and that it is again based on this sort of exterior notion of fitness of what makes fitness um the fitness of traits and natural selection depends on the environment the fitness in social darwinism is independent of any environmental uh, uh interaction whatsoever they are inherent traits um and Darwin's theory, he really did not make any claims about socioeconomic status. Social Darwinism was all about that. Uh, the People are poor or rich because they cannot be otherwise. That's their place in society. That's it. Um, so that, that was a bit of a problem. Many early anthropologists subscribed to this and contributed to it. Uh, especially through ideas like unilineal cultural evolution. This is the idea that um, all societies must progress through certain stages until they become civilized, quote-unquote. And, of course, civilized would be um, uh, equated to European culture, right? Uh, although they would get into arguments with each other over who was the most civilized, but uh, but in general, Europeans were at the top of the of the scale, and everybody else was below them. Um, uh, this is not the way culture changes. We see no evidence of this kind of evolution, uh, and we see societies go from one form of society to another. If, if we were grading them on this scale, we send them move forward and backwards on it. People are adapting to their environment and the political realities around them. Uh, it has nothing to do with a predetermined scale. Uh, and every, every culture is civilized. They all have a civilization. Uh, they just don't all look like Europeans. Um, so yes, not surprisingly, Europeans always ended up at the top of the scale. And uh, this was always used as proof for why Europeans were superior and why they should be in charge of other groups of people. Uh, we'll come back to that when we talk about colonialism. Industrialization, the Industrial Revolution, uh, one of the key effects is it caused massive migrations of people from rural areas to urban areas where the jobs were. 
Um, this also changed things like uh, social mobility, uh, uh, the way people relate with one another, and so forth. Um, with rapid population rises, you see labor becoming very cheap in the, uh, in the cities, and laborers themselves start competing with one another for, to offer their labor up for the lowest price. Um, we also see a breakdown in family ties because with distance came, uh, a watered down influence from the family in terms of enforcing patterns of marriage or behavior, um, how, where people would move after they were married, that sort of thing. So traditional family networks started to break down. Uh, traditional property rights began to change, uh, Women were allowed to work for a wage, which gave them some young single women had some degree of, of economic independence as long as they remained single. Um, and, uh, of course, this also challenged slavery economics. This is in the United States, especially. This is, uh, um, this is part of why the war, the Civil War was fought in terms of slavery. Uh, uh, there was an economic battle going on as well. Um, that doesn't mean it wasn't about slavery. It, the, the Southern states were fighting for states' rights, but it was the states' right to have slaves. That was the right they were fighting for. Uh, so it was all about slavery, but there's also more to it, um, uh, as well. Um, so, yeah, so the Industrial Revolution is making it easier to make things, which lessens the, ironically, lessens the need for uh, full manpower. And you can pay man, a, a man much less than his living way, much less than it takes to support a slave, where you have to feed, uh, clothe, house uh, a human being. Uh, it's much cheaper to simply pay them a pittance and tell them it's their responsibility to go find that stuff. I'm not suggesting slavery is a good thing, but I'm saying economically, this was the battle that was going on. Um, you also see with this, the rise of a new social class, a middle class, and it's composed of what Karl Marx called the bourgeoisie. Um, the bourgeoisie are there in Marx's sort of notion. There are the aristocrats. There's the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The aristocrats are aristocratic. They are sort of old family money. Uh, the money is less important than their official status in the governing of the country. Uh, the middle class, on the other hand, probably has more power because they not only have money, they own the means of production. That is, they own the factory machines that make the things. They need to pay workers to do the work to make the machines go. But since they own the machine outright, they can make as many or as few as they want. They have more control over the, their economic power. Uh, along with this came a new managerial class. So there was an obsession in, in order to make these factories more efficient, the, there was a new field called management that universities began to teach and they produced these people called managers who were in between, uh, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And they were there to oversee the proletariat, but they were paid handsomely for it. Uh, they continue to be today. Um, that is not an accident. Um, so all of this is backed by this ideology of social Darwinism, by the way, too. You know, this is, everybody needs to stay in their place in this system. Uh, and the bourgeoisie get more and more powerful. Um, so you can see that European society in the late 19th centuries is itself undergoing rapid and massive sociocultural and economic changes. Oops. Finally, colonialism. Now, in terms of European colonialism, anthropologists took part 
in this in the 19th and even well into the 20th century, largely by serving as administ uh, serving colonial administrators in terms of feeding them information about local populations and how best to govern uh, and control them, uh, how best to deal with the 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 problems of uh, the local people. Um, this oftentimes meant that anthropologists were portraying the, this sort of fed into this idea of the natural unilineal evolutionary superiority of Europeans. So the idea that uh, Europeans are mo the most civilized and, and therefore there's the so-called white man's burden that is to bring civilization to all the other peoples of the world. Uh, and as a result, anthropologists often sort of portrayed local peoples as quote unquote savages, as uncivilized, and always in need of colonial order. And there's a very vicious cycle between sort of for anthropologists to get access to those groups, they have to be in good with the colonial government. But to be in good with the colonial government, you kind of have to throw those local groups under the bus uh, that was going on there. So whether their intentions were true or not, they were part of a system that supported, where anthropology was supporting colonial government. The American picture is similar, uh, but a little bit different. Anthropology really comes out of the so-called Indian problem. Um, the uh, basically what happens when you displace millions of people off of their uh, of indigenous people off of their land? How do you govern them? Govern them, especially when demand for the land you've moved them to is high and shrinking. The land they can live on is shrinking all the time. How do you support these people? How do you how do you sort of deal with them? Um, uh, E.B. Tyler, who I mentioned before, one of the first anthropologists, American anthropologists, uh, um, uh, along with others, advised government directly in terms of how to manage these people. Um, these ideas of cultural evolution proved the inferiority of Native Americans. Uh, and as they were displaced, they, the notion that they were disappearing began to be sort of romanticized. So uh, we start seeing the image of the so-called noble savage, the, the, this sort of wistful remembrance for a time gone by when the, uh, when the Native American lived in perfect harmony with the land, etc., etc. Not according to the way that they talk about it themselves, but in ways that very much sort of paint them as gone. Uh, when in fact they weren't. Um, you also have, along these same lines, the birth of something called salvage anthropology, which was uh, a big proponent of which was uh, Alfred Krober, uh, who um, uh, was had started a huge project, which has had some interesting payoffs, but um, basically worked on the notion that Native Americans are disappearing. We have to capture the ethnographic and the material culture and the physical data as fast as we can before it's gone forever. Uh, very much looked at culture as something frozen in time. Uh, very much sort of uh, fed into a kind of fervor for, frankly, stealing, in many cases, uh, Native American property uh and goods um and in some cases like here this is ishi who if you went to school in california you probably have have uh, come across ishi before uh he this is a rather sad story i won't go into the whole thing but essentially he was sort of uh, uh he was supposedly the last surviving member of his tribe uh, up in Northern California, and he spent the remainder of his days in the UC uh, Museum of Anthropology. This is in the early 1900s. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and um, uh, was part of this sort of mission to try and preserve this stuff. Now, oddly, uh, 
the years and years of successful colonial attempts to destroy Native American culture uh, had the effect eventually of many tribes losing their languages uh, completely. In the 1980s, people started wanting to get these identities back. They started fighting back for these things. And interestingly enough, it's on wax recordings that Krober and many of his um, students um, kept that they are they have recorded people's great grandparents and grandparents talking in their native language and teaching the na native language. And so, this weird colonial project had at least a, one silver lining uh, that doesn't necessarily redeem it, but it's an interesting sort of story that without that, many of these languages may have been lost. Uh, but that's not an accident. That was a deliberate attempt by the government to destroy these cultures. So, um, all right. Uh, also, yes, anthropologists were heavily involved in the eugenics movement. I should point out, though, that by the 1920s, uh, and 30s, many anthropologists were actually the ones arguing against eugenics and pointing out the uh, the flaws in that. Uh, anthropologists go to war. Um, uh, World War II was an interesting time. Um, uh, Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead and many other uh, famous anthropologists from the time uh, aided the U.S. government in trying to develop cultural profiles on especially uh, the Japanese people. Um, they were an utter mystery to most of the West at that point in time. Uh, and so very little was known about them. And obviously we couldn't send people there to learn about it in the middle of a war. Um, but um, Benedict developed a method by which she could glean as much information as she could from uh, broadcasts, publications, interviews with recent immigrants, as well as immigrants who've been here for a little while. Uh, and although inaccurate in many ways, it was accurate enough to prepare uh, uh, the U.S. government in terms of planning the reconstruction of, of Japan after the Second World War. Um this book became a very popular book called The Chrysanthemum and the Sword later on, uh, but um, uh, the biggest thing is that it changed the tone of the post-war occupation and is a big reason why the emperor was allowed to remain on his throne after, uh, after the war, uh, because it was insights about the Japanese people that led, uh, that convinced them that uh, if we were to get rid of their emperor, we would lose all popular support for our occupation, um, which it was. It was an occupation. All right. Around the same time, the British Empire is falling apart. The last of the great empires, uh, France's colonial sort of system is starting to split up. Uh, many of these uh, former colonies are now... Um, uh, becoming their own countries, gaining independence. Uh, and uh, by the 1970s, uh, this role that anthropologists had played in colonial government was really uh, coming under scrutiny. Um, the question came up, was it ethical for Euro-Americans, anthropologists now, to study and speak for these recently independent nations? Um Increasingly, these so-called post-colonial voices became more and more prominent in anthropology and an encouragement of so-called native anthropology, that is, anthropology done by people of the place that is being studied, uh, became more and more the norm. And uh, the relationships between culture and power and these global forces of colonialism, which were that, at that point turning into our modern globalized system, um, really came under scrutiny. For the Americans, it was after 
uh, the real reckoning came after Vietnam. Uh, one of the things that came out in the 1970s uh, at one of the AAA meetings was that uh, the CIA and the U.S. military throughout the Vietnam War and even before that had been using anthropological research and researchers to plan illegal operations. Uh, some anthropologists knowingly cooperated in these efforts. Others did not know that their funding body was secretly a front for the CIA. Um, but this came to a head at, um, in the 1970s, and this was the impetus for the first code of ethics in the American Anthropological Association. Because, you know, whereas working with the government during the Second World War was seen as okay, Vietnam was a very different war, uh, and a... and People were not accepting the logic that um, it was okay to sort of help the government do the things that it was doing, which were quite brutal, in fact, at the time. So, what does ethics look like today? Well, as I said, one of the primary goals of anthropology is to do no harm. You have a primary ben uh, you have a primary obligation to your informants or collaborators or participants. We have lots of different names for the people we work with. Um, and uh, to the larger anthropological community, but also the larger community, uh, um, all the other communities you live in as well. Uh, you have obligations to your funding bodies, anybody who enabled your research, uh, and to other anthropologists, and to the, the gathering of knowledge as a good unto itself as well, though it's not the primary goal. Um, we have an obligation to share our research whenever possible, uh, but at the same time we have to balance that with an obligation of privacy for our informants. So we do interesting things, so a lot of times anthropologists will write ethnographies, but the people you're reading about aren't actually a single person in many cases. They will have combined things lots of different people did into a single person so that, that each of those individuals is impossible to identify uh, because that can be dangerous in some situations. Uh, and finally, the idea of giving back. It's not enough to just take. Uh, what are you actually bringing to the people you're working with? Um, how is this an equivalent exchange uh, that benefits both parties? Now, that's not to say that there aren't current ethical dilemmas in anthropology. Uh, from 2007 to 2014 in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the U.S. military embedded social scientists of all kinds, but especially anthropologists and sociologists who had done ethnographic research, uh, into military units to act essentially as advisors. Uh, in one article I read on this in the New York Times, uh, interviewing a, um, uh, I believe it was a colonel sort of for this one. I don't know. I don't know military divisions or whatever, but this one group who said, yeah, a year ago before we had the anthropologist, um, we were knocking down doors in 2 a.m. raids. And now we knocked first because we understand that actually it's incredibly, uh, it's incredibly traumatic, uh, in a culture where, the private space is so important, especially for women, because they may not be veiled and they, they're allowed to not veil in the private space. So if they are not covered uh, in those spaces and you sort of burst in, in addition to the fact that it's just not fun to have your door knocked down, uh, you know, uh, you're causing even more problems uh, during these these times. So, uh, so it, it does appear to have made the military sort of shift its approach in some cases. Uh, although it's still, uh, the AAA's position is still largely that it's condemned, that we shouldn't really do it. But there are some, I think there are some anthropologists who would argue it's a little more complicated than that. So that's one area that is still very hotly contested, uh, because these are the situations where understanding the cultural context on the ground could do a lot to reduce harm uh, in the occupation, but then at the same time, by doing that, you're also enabling the occupation to, to, to continue. So 
which is in the best interest of your informants? That's the question. Um, corporate anthropology, working for corporations, is it ethical to sell products, to help companies sell products or to manage their employees better um, when essentially you're helping them target the people you're studying? So how do you square your obligation to your informants first when you're being paid to exploit them? Right? That's a, t that's a tricky one. Uh, and one many anthropologists struggle with today, uh, although corporate anthropology is a quickly growing field. Um, if you're thinking of studying anthropology, I encourage you to look into this as a career. Just think carefully about how to do it ethically. There's a lot more on this topic in different places. Um, I'm not going to go into darkness in El Dorado, uh, but do, you know, if you haven't already read the, the insert on pages 26 to 27 of your textbook, that will tell you more about that conflict. Um, that is it. I went way over time today. I wasn't expecting to be quite this long, but ethics is not a simple topic, so I'm not surprised it took so long. Um, I hope you understand ethics a little bit better. I hope you understand sort of the way, both where anthropology came from in ter terms of its past and where we're going today and how we think about our obligations to various people and organizations as we do research and what that means to be in order to be uh, an ethical anthropologist. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Stay safe. And I'll see you soon.